2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says this, We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And the title of this brief sermon is Present with the Lord. In this sermon, I am going to explain a basic truth that a lot of Christians seem to overlook, which is that when believers go home to be with the Lord, when believers pass away in this physical life, they go on to be present with the Lord. They spend eternity in the Lord's presence. And the reason why I'm preaching this is because there's a common misconception that you see in pop culture, and sadly, even some Christians have started to adopt this misconception that if you have a saved loved one who dies and goes to heaven, they'll say something like this. Well, they're watching over us right now. Well, your aunt died and went to heaven. She's watching over you. Your cousin died and went to heaven. He's watching over you. And I'm going to explain why that is false. And if I have done my job and explained this sermon thoroughly, you will be grateful why that is false. The fact of the matter is, when our loved ones die and go into the presence of the Lord, they are serving and worshiping God day and night forever and ever. They are not even thinking about anything that goes on on this earth. And that ought to bring us some comfort. And let's explain why that is. Let's go to Psalm 16, which is in the Old Testament. Psalm 16 gives us the contrast between heaven and hell. And if you look at how it, it describes it, if you look at Psalm 16, let's look at the very end there in verses 10 and 11. It says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now that's very important to understand. In verse 10 we see it talking about hell, but then in verse 11, we see the contrast. We see it talking about heaven. It says the path of life. Remember how Jesus said that he gives unto us eternal life? That's talking about us being able to go to heaven. It says in thy presence is fullness of joy. Remember how Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And remember, that's God's presence. That's with God up in heaven. It says, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So what this tells us is that heaven is a place of perfect peace. Heaven is a place of permanent joy. We are in God's presence forevermore. And when we're up in heaven, we are not even aware of anything that's going on on the earth. And that's super important because this is the verse that I would go to, this next verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 to explain why the teaching of, oh, well, your aunt, your aunt, your mother, or your father, whoever, they're up in heaven looking down. No, they're not. And I'm going to show why that's wrong. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Look at verse 22. It says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. Now, here's why that's important. A man rejoices in its own works. Not this whole idea of being lazy and expecting stuff to be handed out for you. You know, that's an important side lesson. I know that that is not the point of this sermon, but the Bible always has wisdom for you no matter where you look. That's why the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof. Because here we see it says rejoice in his own works. There, so no communism. No socialism where you force someone else to work for you, then you rejoice in their works. No, you rejoice in your own works. Look what it says. For that is his portion. Watch this. This is very important. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Let me read that one more time. Who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? In other words, when you die and go on to be with the Lord, no one's going to show you what's happening after you. So this whole idea of being aware of what's going on on the earth after you have departed to go be with the Lord, it does not happen. Now let's stop and think about this for a second, why it's so important for that not to happen. Because the earth is not a place of pleasures forevermore. The earth is not yet a place of infinite joy. That's why Jesus has to come and renew it. That's why Jesus said heaven and earth shall pass away. 
That's why the Bible says, Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. Look at the end of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah for that, Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. Look at the book of Revelation also, the last three chapters. It talks about God making a new earth because the current one is full of sin. The current one is full of destruction. Now think about this. If your loved one was watching you down from heaven, that means they're also watching when you sin. That means they're also watching when you do wrong. So wouldn't that in some way interfere with the joy forevermore that they're receiving the presence of the Lord? Because light and dark cannot dwell together. So if they're up in heaven with God, they're not aware of anything that goes on on this earth. Now, here's the thing. We all, we're all human. And some small part of us, we want that to be true because we don't want to think about the fact that we're not going to see them for a very long time, for decades and decades and decades, right? So we kind of, in our mind, we want to feel like they're still here with us. But the fact is, if they are truly at peace, if they are truly experiencing everlasting life and joy, they're not here with us because this is nothing compared to what God's going to bring. The suffering in this present time is nothing compared to the glory that should be revealed in us. Now, think about this. What if, you know, you have a lot of people who say, oh man, I just wish I could bring them back. I just wish I could, you know, see them one more time. I just wish I could lay eyes on them one more time. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I miss my grandmother. You know, I lost her in February. She went home to be with the Lord. I just wish I could have one more hug. I just wish I could tell her I love you and hear her say I love you one more time. I just wish we could have another one of our, you know, really friendly, really happy conversations one more time. But you know what? She's in a far better place right now. And for her to even be aware of what's going on in the earth, that would be a severe downgrade. And let's prove that. Did y'all know there was one time in the scripture where a departed saint who went home to be with the Lord was brought back to earth for a brief moment in time and look how his reaction was. And this is why you'll be grateful that it's not true that your loved one up in heaven's looking down on you. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 28. This is a story in which King Saul, who was anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel, King Saul had gotten out of God's will. And as a result, God removed his blessings and anointings off of King Saul's life. Now, after King Saul lost his anointings, lost his blessings, we see that the prophet Samuel, who had anointed him to be king in the first place, died. And so Saul just wished he could have one more conversation with Samuel so that Samuel can tell him the will of God in his life, right? He just wished he could have that guidance back. And here's the thing. Samuel and Saul were kind of close because Samuel kind of took him under his wing, kind of tried to help him out a little bit. But let's look at what happens here when the Lord allowed Samuel to come back from the dead for a day, basically. Not for a whole day, but basically he allowed him in spirit to appear before Saul and talk to him. Let's look how that interaction went. If you look at 1 Samuel 28, verse 11, it says, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. So make a long story short. King Saul is talking to a witch, talking to a woman who deals with divination, evil spirits, Ouija boards, crystal balls, that type of thing, and is saying, hey, I need to talk to my friend that died. I need to talk to him. Now, here's the thing. Normally, she just conjures up an evil spirit to do whatever her work is, right? But in this particular instance, God supernaturally allowed uh, Samuel to come back from the dead for a moment in time to talk to Saul. Now, let's look at what Samuel's reaction was when he had to go visit earth after being up in heaven for so long. Look what it says in verse 15 of this chapter. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered and said, I'm sorry, and it says, And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Now, we see a lot of important meat in this verse. Now look at the first thing. Look at Samuel's reaction. When God allowed Samuel to come down from heaven to go talk to Saul for a moment, was Samuel happy about it? Look what it says. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, 
Why hast thou disquieted me? The word disquiet means to wake somebody up from sleep, wake somebody up from rest, disturb a person that was relaxing. Because think about it, if you're in the presence of God, who's perfect in all his ways, who's full of joy forevermore, and you got to step away from that for a second to go deal with this human being with all his sin, that's a severe downgrade. So if our loved ones who departed in Christ could come back and watch over us and all this stuff, that would be a great disturbance to them because it'd be disturbing their rest. And that's why we should be glad that this doctrine of the dead watching over you is not true because how could they have perfect rest if they still have to interact with sinners? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If you notice, Samuel didn't say here, Saul, Saul, I missed you. Saul, my boy, how's it going? How's Jonathan? How's your family? How are my grandsons or my sons doing? How's the kingdom? If you notice, when he, after Samuel had been in heaven for some time, he didn't care about anything that was going on on the earth. He just wanted to get back to his rest. Like, what do you want, dude? I don't have time for this. I'm with Jesus. I don't have time with this. I'm with Jehovah Jireh. I don't have time with this. I'm with the Prince of Peace. What do you want, dude? Just get out my... That's sort of the reaction that we see here. But why did this happen in the first place? Let's continue with the verse. I am sore distressed. You know, if you have the peace of Jesus in your heart, if you have the Prince of Peace in your heart, if you have the peace which passeth understanding, if you have the comfort and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost, then you're not going to go seeking for the dead for your advice. You're going to seek to the living God. You're going to say, hey, let me pray. Hey, let me open my Bible. Hey, let me be in the will of God so I can be blessed and have joy in my heart. A lot of people, they have unresolved issues that they didn't get to resolve with that person that died. Maybe your loved one departed and your last conversation with them was an unfriendly one before they went on to be with the Lord. Maybe your loved one, you didn't treat them like you should have, and they got to the end of their life and you regretted that you never got to make it right. Listen, we can't fix everything, but you know what? We can keep our eyes on Jesus. We can pray to the living God. We can serve God day and night. We can, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We can confess to God what we did wrong. The Bible says, whoso confesseth and forsaketh findeth mercy. And that's talking about God blessing you in your physical life for when you get things right. You may not always be able to make it right, but you know what? If they went to heaven, it doesn't matter what you did to them. Jesus is gonna make them all right. So you just focus on serving God. Maybe you can Make it up by blessing their family. Like you stole something, that person died, you never got to give it back. Give it back to their family and then some. And then ask God to forgive you. And that is the way that you can be blessed of God. So a lot of people, they go and look for peace among the dead because they have not found their peace in the living God. And we need to keep our eyes focused squarely on the Lord. It says here, and answer with me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Listen, we have 66 books of what we shall do here. So this whole idea of wanting to just reach out to our deceased loved one who's with the Lord, God can give them way better care than the best physician on this earth. God can give them way better peace than the strongest security guard or police officer on this earth. God can give them way better joy than the longest and most expensive vacation on this earth. We ought to take comfort in that, knowing that they are being taken so well care of, they're being taken care of so well that they don't need us anymore. They're with Jesus. We should be happy for them. And this whole idea of, I wish I could just bring them back for more day, in a sense, it's kind of selfish because you want yourself to be happy seeing them again at the expense of the eternal happiness that they now have. So we need to keep that in mind. Now look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. We're almost done here. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible reminds us to seek God and put God first because you have a lot of people, they'll say something like, well, your loved one's looking down on you. Make them proud. Listen, if your loved one was a godly person who led you in a godly way, then yes, do things that would make them proud, but don't stop there. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm doing what my mama would have wanted me to do. I'm doing what my daddy would have wanted me to do. I'm doing what my grandfather would have wanted me to do. Now, here's the thing. They were a human too. They were a sinner too. They were saved by grace the same way you are. They're not perfect. So if you measure yourself only against the standard of the loved one you just lost, 
then you're going to fall short in your Christian life. But if you measure yourself against God, if you say, let me please God, let me focus on what God wants me to do, that's holding yourself to the proper and higher standard. Colossians 3.17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of your mom that just died. Is that what it says? And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the friend you just lost. Is that what it says there, y'all? No. It says, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So our goal in life, no matter who we lose, is to make God proud, to make the Lord Almighty proud. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He hath sealed us unto the day of redemption. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He begun a great work in us and he will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. God is the one that is always with us. He is our comforter. He is our bread from heaven. He is our living water. And we should strive every day to please him, even in the midst of loss. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 15 is where we're going to end it here today. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13 says this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Don't sorrow like people that have no hope. When your loved one dies, yes, you ought to weep. Yes, you ought to mourn. But there's a time to mourn and there's time to rejoice. There's a time for sadness. There's a time for joy. That's the fact of the matter is, yes, you will not see them for a very long time. But you know what? Let's continue the verse. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You're going to see them again someday. God is going to bring you together someday. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Prevent there means to go before. So in other words, those that die, when Christ comes back, those that died in Christ are going to get their physical body back. It's going to be a glorified body, of course. And then we as believers will be caught up with him. And that's what it basically says in the, let's actually finish the chapter. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those that die, the, your, your loved one, your grandma who went home to be with the Lord, your uncle that went home to be with the Lord, your friend that went home to be with the Lord, guess what? When Jesus comes back to take us all to heaven with him, they're going to be first in line. That's, that, that ought to be a comforting thought. Not only do they get infinite joy now, but they get to be first in line for the glorified body. Let's continue verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we're going to get that fullness of joy that's in his presence also. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So what are these words? The fact that they are asleep with Christ. They are in a place of perfect rest. And you know what? You're going to see them again someday. So when your loved one went home to be with the Lord, you did not tell them goodbye. You just simply told them, see you later. And we will see them later. God bless you.